Hey folks, Darren with Fervent Astronomy. Today, I have a lens that reminds me a lot of myself, actually. The Sony 24-F1.4 G Master lens. Uh, this is arguably the lens that set off the revitalization of Sony's G Master line. Uh, this is an excellent lens in most people's estimation. I'm sure we're going to find out here quickly how good it is for astrophotography. But this lens is a lot like I said, like me, it seems like, you know, it's relatively new, but the more you think about it, the older you realize that it actually is. And uh, for someone who's got some gray hairs coming in, I'm certainly starting to feel that myself. So I feel a bit of a kindredness with this particular lens. But 24, definitely a doable focal length for astrophotography, especially at f1.4. It's feasible to get some exposures on track. Of course, tracked, definitely. How does this lens hold up? Is it going to be good for astrophotography? Are you the type of person who likes that sort of in-between focal length, in-between, you know, really wide and something more normal, like a, a normal view, like a 50 millimeter lens? Well, let's find out. Howdy folks, welcome to Lightroom. Here I've got a bunch of samples from the Sony FE 24mm f1.4 G Master lens. And while this lens is a couple years old, so are some of these samples as it turns out. <laughs> I actually have some stuff to show you that spread over three different years for some reason. So go figure. I have samples here taken with, I think, probably just two cameras. Uh, the Sony Alpha 1 50 megapixel camera and the A7R Mark V 60 megapixel camera nominally and both of these are taken with my usual modality for the alpha one these shots are untracked look like 15 second exposures each to give you an idea of what you can expect as far as things like star trails go and then when you come up to the tracked samples for the with the a7r mark 5 they're all 60 seconds or thereabouts and all tracked with the fornax mounts light track 2 portable star tracker which fervent astronomy just so happens to be uh, a not only a dealer of, but Fornax's exclusive North American distributor. So if you were interested in learning more about that, please head over to fervenastronomy.com. Actually, if you check the link in the description, you will find a link back to the site anyway, because it will provide you with some useful information concerning things like ISO invariants, because you'll notice I'm shooting these photos at two different ISOs based on the specific cameras. And that is because these cameras are ISO invariant, and or another way to think about it is they only each have two analog amplification stages and all the rest of the ISOs are essentially fake. The camera is just doing the same thing you do in Lightroom here, bumping the exposure up when you choose an ISO higher than 320, for instance, with this A7R Mark V. It's just boosting the exposure, but it's locking it into your RAW. And that has a bit of a downside in that you can actually clip some highlights and things that are bright like stars, galaxy cores, bright star forming regions and nebula, that might not be something that you want to do because you can't recover that information. Whereas if you shoot at the base ISO, or in this case, the highest base ISO, what will happen is you'll get the same noise performance, the same ability to recover shadows, the same image quality, the same ability to reach the same exposure, but you might retain some more highlight detail. That's what I've made my habit of. And as such, every time I have to do one of these reviews, I have to repeat the same thing over and over again. So anyway, link in the description will lead you eventually to an article that will explain it all in great detail for you. Where you'll also find most or all of these samples, which you can download, which you can pixel peep, you can gaze into the corners lovingly for hours and hours, marveling at whatever aberrations or lack thereof we uncover here. But they are my copyrighted work, so please respect that and the effort I went into getting these samples. Please don't redistribute or distribute any of these samples online or otherwise. Please don't misrepresent them as your own. And please do not use any of these images as the basis for your own review. Please use it in good faith for the purpose I'm providing, which is for your personal perusal and vetting of this lens's performance to see if it is a lens that you might want to have in your kit. All right, now that that's out of the way, I'm just going to boost the exposure for these a uh, touch to give us something to actually look at. And I might only take a peek here at the f1.4 sample for the alpha one. That's what you would be using this lens at most likely. So if we jump in here, we can see star trails at 15 seconds, 24 millimeters isn't, you know, 12 millimeters. So it's going to zoom in a little bit and you are going to notice star trail sooner. 
do have some fringing here, which we'll address in a little bit. Overall, zoomed out, I can't really make out the star trails that bad. So you might be happy with this. Let's see how much we can recover it. That's three stops boosted, and things are getting pretty noisy, but probably still usable. It looks okay around the edges and corners. Holy moly, there's a lot of satellites in here, though. That's what you can expect if you just plop this lens on a tripod. Probably not the worst performer in the bunch. If you have a lower megapixel camera, you can even boost that exposure time up a little bit. Get around the same reproduction for star trails without them showing up like this. So now let's jump into the meat here. These I took just this winter and then sat on them, I guess, for six months. Ah, uh, boy. We're just going to check one thing really quickly. Now you might be able to recognize Ursa Major up here. And if we look into the top left-hand corner of the navigator, we can see a couple of things. First of all, there is some vignetting. Darker corners, that's what you would expect. thing that I wouldn't expect is for the left side to be a bit darker overall and be quite so heavy with the dark. Leads me to believe there might be an asymmetry in this lens. Brighter spot in the middle, brighter as you get to the middle, which makes perfect sense, but might lead to a little loss of contrast. If we stop down just to f1.6, especially if you're watching the navigator there, that bright spot does disappear without harming much of the exposure in the corners or around the edges here. So you might actually choose, in this case, to shoot at 1.6, because you're not giving up too much, especially if you watch the histogram but you're getting a bit of more even exposure across the frame. That is up to you. I don't think we'll have much of a contrast penalty here, but let's take a look. So again here, 1.4, 1.6, definite improvement in contrast if we stop down even that small amount, but your mileage may vary. Here we do have a little bit of fringing, a little bit of chromatic aberration, possibly some coma actually starting right here in the middle of the frame. I don't know if you can see here but the stars are a little bit more defined and brighter at the bottom here and then they get a little fuzzy edge on this side and they all tend to be in alignment here pointing this way so this lens wide open might have some coma which isn't gonna make or break things all said and done but it is there and i'm trying to figure out what kind of coma it would be i'm gonna imagine internal coma here if that is what's going on Basically, coma internal or external is named thus by the way the little fuzzy bit points. So in the case of coma or chromatic aberration, as it's called, it's supposed to actually resemble the tail of a comet. Here, it's not bad enough to do that, but you can imagine if it was a little bit worse, you get like a fuzzy tail out behind the star to make it look like a comet, comet, coma, chromatic aberration. That is where the name comes from. And in this case, they're fuzzing here. So I'm feeling like it's pointing me <laughs> in this direction. So this, unsurprisingly, actually, might be more towards the center, the quote unquote center of whatever this particular lens is, because it does look, if you remember at the navigator there, it does look like it's vignetting harder on the left side, which does make for a little bit of an asymmetry. So one might expect that the quote unquote center of the lens would be a little asymmetrical. That being said, some elements in the lens might be shifted, some might not. It might be a bit of a tilt here or there. So it might be that some aberrations will show up worse in some places and overlap with others in other places. But that is a good thing to know. This is, I think, one of the earlier G Master lenses in the new generation that were a bit better, but this is still a bit of an older lens. So I'm not surprised to see a little bit of that. All that out of the way, I don't really detect too much in the way of spherical aberrations, which is probably not unexpected considering this is more than likely an aspherical lens. Basically, the, the stars are staying nice and tight. They're not getting like a big low contrast halo or anything. So I think that's safe to say. Let's check out the corners here where we can see that we've got some dog bones almost. They look like little cartoon dog bones. So this is astigmatism, and this is what you would consider to be tangential astigmatism. So we talked about coma, I showed you what coma was. A lot of people think this is what coma is. This is not coma. We talked about coma. This is astigmatism. So there are two types. You have tangential, which will radiate from the center to the edges or vice versa. Essentially, the stars will stretch out along these radii. And because of that, they'll get this elongated shape. Sagittal, if you look at this one right here, this might be sagittal. Sagittal astigmatism is at a 90 degree angle to the tangential, although the little wings or little 
distortions that it can cause can sometimes look to curve, but they'll never be along the same radius as the tangential. They'll always be in opposition to it. And here, this little blue fringing, I think, is what's going on. I am also noticing here that while we do have this sort of really weird shape happening, we're also, it looks like, defocusing the star. So I believe this lens probably also has field curvature. What's field curvature? Well, it's when one part of the lens, let's say the center is in focus, and another part of the lens, in this case, let's say the corners and edges, are out of focus. That is simply a factor of trying to put light through a bunch of curved glass elements and project it onto a flat surface. It's never going to be perfect. Things can be in different amounts of focus in different parts of the frame. So while things look pretty in focus here in the middle, when you get out here, astigmatism notwithstanding, you can see that they look a little bit bigger than they should. They look defocused. And as we scroll in towards the midframe, they start to still have a weird shape, but look at least a little bit more round or blobby. And then as we get towards the middle, you know, you wouldn't really notice. And this is going to be similar or different, but still bad in all of the corners where they may or may not look the same. Although in this case, it is pretty consistent. Here, these are very defined. That is definitely a, the first time I've seen this exact kind of shape. It almost looks like a clothespin or something like that. And it is very serious about it. It is very serious about those shapes. So that is, it's kind of, it's kind of funny, actually. You can see as we get in towards the center of the frame here, things tighten up, although they still remain a little bit weird. You can see on that edge of the, the stars pointed towards the center of the frame where it starts to look like coma as we get to this point. So that is quite a lot going on. Normally, I wouldn't expect a G Master to have quite this level of various aberration, but this is the older, well, it's not the oldest, but it is a fairly old G Master. It's not completely unexpected. Now let's just run through the different apertures here. This is at 1.4, 1.6, as we talked about, things darken up a little bit in the middle. 1.8 here, it's much more even across the frame, but we are shooting at 1.8. F2, 2.2, and 2.8. Things are quite dark. Come back to 1.4 here, and we'll zoom into the center, and we will drop down to 1.6. Here, things are already looking a little bit better. Let's see about the coma that we are noticing here. So try and get the same framing. I would say it's still here a little bit at 1.6, but it is improved relative to 1.4. Let's see what happens if we stop down to 1.8. At 1.8, it definitely looks like it cleans up, boosts the exposure a bit. And here we can see, yeah, that coma is rectifying itself a lot. F2, things are getting quite dark. 2.2, 2.2, same thing. And 2.8, it's just kind of getting past what I would consider useful. So definitely some aberrations here at 1.4. A bit of an asymmetry, probably. Fair amount of astigmatism. Let's see what happens to that as we stop down. So 1.4, 1 1.6, 1 1.8. It's not really cleaning up. F2, yeah. 2.2, 2.8, yeah, not really worth it. I would say, based on the astigmatism in the corners and the field curvature, I wouldn't bother stopping down for that reason specifically. One thing you might be able to do with this lens, and when you have field curvature, it can provide a possible remediation, is that you don't focus in the corners, because that'll put the center out of, out of focus, but you might focus in the midframe somewhere here, and that might give you a possible medium amount of defocusing in the center and in the corners, which might make both look acceptable, especially when viewed like this, because the one thing that is the enemy of an image when it comes to these types of aberrations is how it affects the viewing experience of an image. You and I can both know that it looks like little clothespins here in the corners, but you can't see that zoomed out really. If you can, then that's something that you might want to consider whether or not that lens can be used like this. But if you can't make out the shape, how is the size? Does the size stay consistent around the frame? Are potential viewers likely to notice that the stars in the center are much smaller than the si size of the stars in the edges and corners? Is it going to distract from the actual image? So these are the considerations you might want to think about. Based on this alone, though, I don't know that I would really stop down, at least not past 1.6, because you're really not fixing anything in the corners there. Let's look at the develop module. Come in here, chromatic aberration correction. Usually doesn't work on the purple fringe, so we'll use our little dropper, which usually does in here. We see that's cleaned that up. That can be a little less distracting. 
And if we come into our profile corrections here, we can see there is a slight transformation. Right dead center in the middle of the frame actually seems flat, so not barrel, not pin cushion. But it does appear that the corners, most of the rest of the mid frame is being pulled towards the viewer. So there's a slight transformation and you are losing primarily at the top, bottom, left and right edges, a little bit of the stars. So you're losing a bit of focal length, if you want to think of it like that, a little bit of field of view, but you are keeping the diagonal field of view. I don't think the corners are moving much or at all. Mind you, when we enable the corrections, it does apply a vignetting correction, which more or less works, except for this left hand side here is still very dark. This is likely going to require a custom mask to really fix that. And I mean, once you have it, you can just reapply it to any frame, but that's, a, I would say probably that's the most disappointing thing about this lens from my point of view, being that it's a G Master lens is that there is this asymmetry here. For something that you buy in box, you wouldn't expect to have that type of quality control or lack thereof, I should say. So all in all, not the worst lens, definitely not the best lens. This is definitely an interesting set of astigmatism shapes. In aggregate though, it looks all right. One thing that we can look at before we go is a real world image, give you an idea about how much this actually translates into your photography. And if we come out here, you can see I've got two images down here, both same shot, same night, both separated, of course, by a little bit of time and processed a bit differently. These are frames from maybe a future time lapse, but these are both eight seconds taken with the Sony Alpha 1 at ISO 500 wide open at 1.4. And while they look a little bit crunchy here after, like these are both half processed, after a full processing and running through noise reduction, the image turned out actually pretty well. You can see here, we've got the Milky Way, got some sky glow. And of course we've got some foreground. This side here is going to be the side that had the darker vignetting. But even in this case, it's not causing much of an issue. So all things considered, this is how we actually use a lens as opposed to this, right? So again, you got to think about how you're going to use it in real life and whether these kinds of things are make or break for you. So let's wrap this up and see what talking head me has to say. All right. Well, not really surprised, frankly, you know, this, like I had mentioned at the jump was the beginning of Sony's uh, foray into sort of let's say really high quality G master lenses uh, from flourishes like the manual aperture ring, which is the declickable focus buttons, actually kind of a sloppy focus ring there, but this has the fit and finish and optical quality that people in this day and age have come to expect from Sony G master lenses. This is definitely a lens that I think I'm going to use uh, for astrophotography more, or at least try to. I'm really trying to work in some different looks uh, into my repertoire, and I think this is one of the ways to go. But that's my personal opinion. Everyone's different. My whole reason for doing reviews like this are to give you, dear viewer, the chance to assess the lens yourself and see if it's giving you the kind of quality and results that you need in your workflow. So is this a lens for you? Only you can answer that question. At any rate, I hope this video has been helpful. As always, I'm Darren. This is Fervent Astronomy. And uh, yeah, hope to see you in the next one. Take care.